Welcome to Chef Marketing Academy. This lecture is on the future of all things digital. It is somewhat complementary to another lecture I have done on economics of the digital age and the two together would make a great video presentation in classes as well as in corporate training uh, activities. So let's just talk about the evolution of the digital age. Agriculture age, which we all know quite a lot, we transformed that into the industrial age, maybe 150 years ago roughly, after the industrial revolution and its commercialization, and it transformed lives, transformed the society, and lots of books, articles have been written about the sociological impact political impact, definitely economic impact, as well as the income disparity and all the stuff that we have heard about the uh, industrial evolution, uh, revolution and its impact on, on our human life. The next area which is equally important and maybe more transformative in my view is the rise of the digital age. In general in economics and business we talk about the post-industrial society primarily as a services economy. While it is true, I believe really what we are doing is transform from the industrial to the digital age. So let's look at the market for all things digital. My estimates are that it is about two trillion dollar global economy and has a market valuation of about four trillion dollars. I think I am conservative in my estimate and it will definitely surpass the manufacturing sector very soon. At two trillion dollar value creation or value addition, it is just about the fourth largest economy in the world. It is bigger than India's GDP U.S. is the largest GDP, almost 14 trillion. China is number two with about six trillion. Japan number three and at two trillion, which I think is a conservative estimate, it is a much bigger in value. So it's a very, it's basically like one large nation essentially. This all things digital is also referred to in the traditional academic literature in the industry as ICT industry information communication technology industry. The two trillion dollar economy that is created, just think about the cell phones alone. Before cell phones and after cell phones, my estimates are running that the revenue on that alone, both for the cell phone sets that are sold, the telephone operators, the wireless carriers, as well as the infrastructure builders, it is almost knocking the doors of $800 billion. That's, that's just one technology alone. So as I said, I think my estimate of $2 trillion is an underestimation. And the journey has just begun as we migrate from what I call Napa Valley to Silicon Valley. What's a Napa Valley? Napa Valley is typical wine growing country in uh, the Bay Area. San Francisco, Northern California. And there you do things at their own time and you define the time, nothing before its time. So speed just was not even useful, considered negative. Silicon Valley, which is only 60, 70 miles apart, is totally opposite. It's, everything is done yesterday. There is no let up whatsoever. So that journey from the industrial to digital age is a journey from Napa Valley to Silicon Valley. However, with the rise of China and India as two very large population economies, all wanting to transition from the agriculture to the industrial age and now into the digital age, the whole all things digital will become Asia centric. Doesn't matter which industry or what part of this all things digital we talk about. And it will become Asia centric. Clearly it is becoming Asia centric. For example, largest 
amount of computer sales are now, PC especially. It is also true of cell phones, will be true in fact of all of the, you know, tablets for example, anything electronic, consumer electronics, everything we look upon it, it's all Asia centric primarily so far and Silicon Valley is already moving into Asia. However, I see the biggest transformation of all things digital with the rise of what I call Shanghai Valley. Shanghai Valley in my estimate is already about 250 to 300 billion dollars, but is rising at a very faster rate than even the Silicon Valley, at least in terms of revenues, if not market capitalization, and will cross easily one trillion dollar just that one city and the valley around that by no later than 2020 is my expectation. Just like none of us ever thought San Jose will become the center of Silicon Valley, it used to be so agriculture, so arid almost land, nobody paid any attention and suddenly got a spark and everything just grew out of the Silicon Valley. If Silicon Valley can grow from nothing to five, six hundred billion dollars in 2025 years, Shanghai Valley will happen sooner and bigger is my forecast. So we have to watch for the rise of Shanghai Valley, which is mostly Taiwan semiconductors, Japanese uh, all things digital and Korean all things digital going in a massive way and all located into one geography. Despite all of the trepidations and anxieties we have about intellectual property rights and whether China will generate its own technologies or will imitate and emulate or copy technologies, I think it's irrelevant matter, Shanghai Valley will arise whether we like it or not. So we need to understand its implications more so than deny its reality. So the journey from the industrial age to digital age is going from the analog technologies to the digital technologies and focus begins to shift the market side is no longer just the industrial customers which is how it used to be mainframe computers were mostly for industrial customers Xerox is even today mostly B2B market primarily it begins to shift toward in fact more and more toward consumer markets. A second dimension I want to talk about is that we have five standalone industries and with digitalization those industries are blurring their boundaries and almost they are becoming fusion. You don't know whether you are talking about a media company or you are talking about a television company or you are talking about a computer company or you are talking about something else. In other words, who would have thought that Google will become a major competitor to all of the media who get their revenues from advertisers and Google is becoming one of the largest uh, I guess platforms for advertising as is Amazon surprisingly and these were unheard of companies and they are all blurring their boundaries because of the digitization or digitalization of all the technologies. So standalone industries will get more and more integrated is the second dimension of what I would like to talk about. So let's define the industry. This two trillion dollar industry that I talked about is actually a five by five matrix. Very simple idea. There are five standalone industries which are labeled vertically as uh, telecommunications which is basically the medium is voice. Then you have the text which is primarily the publishing industry, the medium is text print. Third one is an imaging industry. Fourth one is the video or television industry including movies. And the fifth one obviously is the data industry which is the computing industry. But data is the medium, or video is the medium, etc. as you can see the labels. And what do we do with this information? We create and collect information, that's one row. We display information, which are communication devices of some sort. We store information, the memory devices. We process information, which means all the applications, layers that we know, and ultimately we transport or distribute information. I'll just summarize this chart quickly and then go into details of each one of those industries. 
If you look at vertically, you will see a dot mentioned telecommunication industry core competency strictly in uh, transport and switching or distribution. They collected surprisingly large amount of information, but they never commercialized it well. Actually, at one time, Yellow Pages was the largest advertising medium, more revenues than all television networks put together, CBS, uh, NBC, ABC, and Fox, for example. $18 billion or so, and then it began to nosedive because of all things digital. In other words, people now go online and gather information that otherwise we used to go to white pages and the yellow pages, for example. Yellow pages is itself going online, digitizing itself, its content. So that's very interesting. They are having dumb telephones at one time. So display device is primarily a dumb black telephone as we remember. It has become better. So that's only one competency, which is distribution and switching as it is called. For the publishing industry, the real competency is in creating and collecting information. They have authors, they have uh, column writers, and they aggregate information from different sources, whether it's your newspaper, magazine, television, radio does not make any difference. Imaging. Imaging is something very unique and I've been watching it for quite some time. Here you have companies like Canon, uh, you have companies like Xerox and Kodak, which Kodak has already collapsed unfortunately, but that's an imaging and their key competency is storage. That's really they're good at storage among all those five areas of what do you do, what function do you do with information. Television actually rises a little more. It began primarily by distribution at one time on microwave, eventually satellite and broadcast primarily. It's very fascinating to watch, but from there it began to create and collect information, create programs, especially Hollywood movies came into that category. And of course, eventually television networks produce their own programs or syndicated programs. But its biggest transformation happened with the invention of television as a device. And that was very transformative. And it has therefore transformed, so it has competency in three areas out of the five. But data or the computing industry has competency on everything. It began with storage and processing. Those are the two areas where the mainframe computers really began and they were called CPU, central processing units for example. All the intelligence was housed there as it is in the telephone in the switch for example and dumb peripherals or terminals primarily. I remember my days in the computing industry where I began with punch cards and there was no intelligence there at all. So input output devices had no intelligence. It is really the CPU which had a main thing and that's where IBM just excelled. But with the revolution of the PC coming in as a display device, PC becoming and now the printers, any device that attaches to a computer essentially, and they also began to grow enormously in terms of distribution. For example, rather than rely on the telephone networks, IBM created a network architecture called SNA, and of course they went satellite first, but eventually they also went terrestrial essentially, and you can see the rise of the internet today is really local area network. It's incredible to watch that. Television in the distribution side, the network side, began to have not only broadcast, but cable came along, very major change. And of course, eventually you have the uh, satellite based uh, television programs or uh, direct TV, dish networks, etc. So that's the industry primarily. Each one of them has revenue base, there are components, there are suppliers, and the ecosystem I think is at least two trillion dollars as I've been mentioning before. So let's look at the standalone telephone industry and what's its future. It consists of companies like AT&T, Bell System at one time, Baby Bells, the breakup, they all come together. Verizon, another spin-off from AT&T, which is a Verizon. They are talking about landline companies, which are primarily copper based becoming fiber optic backbone becoming broadband primarily now. NTT, the Nippon Telephone and Telegraph, another big company. 
British Telecom, BT, Deutsche Telekom, France Telecom, these are all state enterprises at one time. They were primarily public sector enterprises. And now you see the rise of second tier of telecom companies actually where the valuation is much bigger, which is wireless companies such as Vodafone, which partly owns Verizon Wireless, Airtel, an Indian company very big in India. They just made an acquisition into Africa and together probably have 200 million subscribers, probably as big as Vodafone. And China Mobile is the last one, which is the largest in subscribers, although revenues wise Vodafone is the biggest. As I said, the competency is switching in transport. Yellow Pages had significant revenues, as I mentioned earlier, than television networks put together. Dumb telephones. I don't know, most of you know, but black telephone was the one which could do only two things, a dial tone to dial out and a ring to incoming calls. That's it. There was no intelligence whatsoever. Today, wireless handset device, the mobile device, such as an iPhone, for example, Blackberry, for example, or Nokia, with not too much of smartphone capability, are absolutely very smart. At one time, network controlled the devices, but today, devices control the networks. My mobile telephone, anywhere in the world I take it, is searching for which network it will be. And I have a choice. So my device controls the future of the network. Network does not control the future of the device. Fundamental paradigm shift in the telephone industry. So with the rise of the smartphones and tablets, etc., you will see a massive transformation of this industry taking place. So what is its future? Wireless and broadband are key to the future. Any one of the telephone companies moves much more aggressively into the wireless world and into the broadband world will survive and those who cannot make the transition will either become small niche players, specialty players or basically go out of business by and large. Now let's look at the publishing industry. Through vast amount of consolidation since the 80s and the 90s, you have now large groups. We are talking about print primarily here. Thompson Group, Pearson Group, McGraw-Hill are the three bigger groups already. Then you have the newspaper groups like New York Times, Los Angeles Times or Times Mirror as it is called and Time Warner in the magazine business. Time Magazine, they have People Magazine, etc. which are great cash flow generators although uh, advertising revenues are declining, subscription is also declining. Their primary business used to be content creation just like movie studios did. But more and more, the capability for publishing companies has to be content aggregation. You don't have to create content, you simply aggregate the contents into what is called LMS, learning management systems, for example. And Thomson has those both for financial services. They, as you know, they compete uh, very aggressively with Bloomberg, which is another one of those. Uh, into the publishing business by and large. And of course, they bought out Reuters, number two or number three company, Thomson Reuters together. And they do West Law, which is all about the legal services. There's a LexisNexis on the other side. So authors, columnists, and editors are very key in this business, or used to be key in this business. Their display device is dumb, paper. Paper has no intelligence. And the storage, the book also has no intelligence whatsoever. Except now, with a tablet like, a, for example, Amazon Kindle, you can easily now provide a lot more intelligence, make it more interactive. All things digital says, how can you make it more interactive with whoever is the user, and how can you get the user to contribute toward the all things digital becomes a paradigm shift. There's a huge physical warehousing and distribution. They still make published books sell it through bookstores, they have wholesalers, they have retailers, all the stuff is in place, but with all things digital, this is about to change. So what is the future? The future of these companies in publishing industry is digital media. How can they go more and more online where the content is constantly fed online 
uh, then they're great content creators and content aggregators. So New York Times is already going online, so LA Times is going online, so Wall Street Journal is online. So you can just think about all of the magazines and the newspapers and how I can get it online, especially with the tablets nowadays, which are very capable of visual presentation, not just alphanumeric or a print presentation. So I can have pictures. I can have even movie, I mean moving pictures or a video for example, and I can have the print content all come together through convergence by and large. The third industry standalone is imaging industry as I mentioned. Companies like Xerox, Kodak, Canon. Most of them have proprietary office equipment, that's the market they cater to. Competency is storage. And they do have industrial capabilities but most of them don't have consumer capabilities. Canon as a camera company, imaging company does go into the mass market, but the real power play has been always into the business to business side like Xerox. And of course there are other companies that have come in like Kyocera, there are many, many more companies now who have taken over the office equipment business away from American companies where you had the dominance of Xerox for example. And Kodak, as I mentioned earlier, is already getting out of business because they could not make the transition from the analog to the digital world. So what is the future of this standalone industry? This industry has to become a multimedia document storage and retrieval industry or a company. And as you have seen from the advertisements, Xerox is trying to do that thing. So lots of materials companies use for employee communication, training for example, for uh, promotions, for marketing and sales materials, you don't need to have copies printed and physically distributed. It can be available online and you can do local printing as most national newspapers do into multiple locations. The editorial content is all created in a central place, distributed by satellite or by you know uh, fiber optic networks and then it comes to local printing presses where they, where they print it. Industrial age, press was the most important part. In this age, content creation and aggregation becomes a lot more important. That's the future of the uh, imaging industry, right? Standalone television industry or basically movies and television. Begins with movies obviously. So television companies, the traditional ones are things like Viacom, which is a group. Disney, another major group, they all own uh, television networks, Fox, Time Warner and Universal NBC, the merger that just took place. But the newer players here are cable companies like Comcast or a DirecTV which is satellite based uh, video communication, Dish Network. They can literally create their own content if they wanted to or syndicate the content. So movie production and distribution, the traditional movie theaters and the screens, back office gets more and more automated, but it is very likely scenario that I really don't need to go to a movie theater. I can have Netflix at my home. I can have Netflix on my iPad, for example. I can have Netflix on my television. And similarly, cable guys are offering the same thing. Comcast as a major company has Xfinity, which is basically video on demand. And the choices are unlimited. AT&T, a telephone company is also getting into the video game, uh, video market essentially by offering what is called AT&T Uverse, which basically allows you wireless distribution within the home essentially. So I don't need to have wire into every location where I want to watch my television programs, my cable programs, etc. Interestingly so. And uh, with the rise of the solid state to HDTV, I think HDTV is more transformative than we have understood so far. Prices are crashing. Remember VCR days? How expensive they were, video recorders? Today they are all bundled as components into these devices now. These HD TVs are all becoming internet compatible. Therefore, I can bring the whole world of information into that HD TV. And eventually HD TV can go to a place where I can have my camera 
merge with my television and I can be both a producer myself of programs. Very different architecture. And it is satellite, cable, direct to home uh, some satellite also, fiber optics, all kinds of media are involved behind the scenes. So migrating to internet and social media user generated content is key to the future of this uh, industry. And we have already seen out of nowhere the rise of YouTube. Think about how much content YouTube aggregates. It doesn't create, it just aggregates, classifies like Google does on the other content essentially. So Google has become a content company, both video and text. Uh, YouTube is mostly video so far, but it's a matter of time before it can be multimedia for example. So the standalone video industry or television industry has to migrate into other areas, as I say, toward internet, which is primarily web-based technology and uh, social media. And as much user-generated content as possible, so you don't have to have your own journalist, your own reporters, your own authors to contribute. There may be some, but the content comes from everybody. And today, the digital uh, cameras are so inexpensive and good quality at the same time. So I can produce good quality video and be a resource to uh, the uh, television industry. I must tell you here as a side comment that at one time in the movie industry, the power was one of the producer who took all of the money raising, risk production, project management and the director. Today, I can literally create a movie in my editing room. I can take footage from different sources and I can create a very low cost movie. Blair's which you might remember as a movie made under five million dollars, all homemade video essentially. You look at the Slumdog Millionaire that won all of the Oscar awards, think about that one and it was made what 15, 20 million dollars only. So this very high expensive production technology has to give way to more and more digital affordable way of producing content by and large and you can get actually free talent by motivating people to contribute content. So that's the key future I think so of this industry and I will talk a little more later on about all of these industries put together. Then the last one of course is the standalone computing industry. This consists of companies like IBM, HP, Cisco Systems, Intel, Microsoft, Oracle and I can give you more names including some semiconductor companies uh, other than just Intel and other than Silicon Valley companies. The core competency of this industry is everywhere, which means among all these five industries, computing industry has the inherent advantage to transform all other industries. CPU based legacy storage and processing is giving way now to more and more online digital server and uh, internet based technologies. I personally believe that PC was a game changer in this industry. In other words, rather than having centralized processing unit where all the intelligence is in the mainframe computer, it got distributed. So distributed memory and processing, just like distributed switching that has, that has taken place almost in the telephone business are very key changes. Ethernet is a very key platform which is basically local area network and the internet comes out of that is an evolution. So I think all of these things are very important, ethernet, satellites, internet uh, capabilities. So computing industry's future lies in multimedia integration. How can computers can do more work of the voice for example, the text for example, the imaging for example is the future as opposed to just data where it began. And at the same time, the future lies in what I call or everybody calls M2M technology, machine to machine. That's where the future is going to show and I will have some more discussion about that as we go into uh, the lecture further. So if I look at the same five by five industry, there were five vertically uh, integrated industries, standalone, telephone, publishing, imaging, television or video and the computing. Now suddenly they become 
integrated across each of the functions, not the technology. So now what you see is create and collect content. Content itself becomes one big industry multimedia and as I said Google is right there. Display. All display devices converge now. So your television is capable of doing your telephone which is capable of doing your printing, everything. Similar things are happening with storage. Storage became computer storage, primarily data storage. Now data storage can do voice storage, for example, video storage, etc., etc. There's a separate industry arising called applications. And of course, we have a lot of apps, mostly on certain platforms, especially the iPhone, iPad platforms have become very popular, but there are many other platforms. And we will see more and more industrial apps arising that is whole processing layer separating out from the storage layer for example. And the last one is distribution which I want to spend a few minutes. If you take the silo of the telephone companies, the old technology was the copper wire. Then they began to use satellite and microwave also primarily for data communication. But the biggest breakthrough came with the wireless cellular technology. So now you have a wireless network and a wireline network. So they have two networks there. Publishing has no networks whatsoever. It's all physical distribution. Imaging has no network either. It's all just physical distribution and local uh, content management or imaging management. Television has actually two key distribution mechanisms. You have the broadcast traditional broadcast radio and television but you also have a cable platform and now they have a satellite based cable as I mentioned so it has three. In the computing industry you have the local area network which has become the internet. You have of course the satellite uh, based uh, data communication. So this all these different networks are different highways each one doing their own things but not connected. For the first time, digital technology and all things digital creates a huge integration of all information highways and it becomes a standalone industry altogether. We don't know whether the telephone companies which should win this race will continue or somebody else will come out of nowhere, such as the cable guys or satellite guys. We have no idea so far. That is not as predictable as to who will be the winner and the loser, but integration is inevitable. And I do believe that the telephone companies have a huge advantage because they are like utility enormous cash generators. And if they can deploy that uh, cash into newer generation of networks etc. Uh, I think it can be done. You know internet in my view is just a dumb network. All it does is gives you an address and a routing. But internet too which is getting evolved by a consortium of universities and the government becomes an intelligent network. And that changes the paradigm completely and it's right on the horizon no more than 10-15 years from now we will be all getting used to it. So all what it does in this transformation of these five industries, a two trillion dollar ecosystem into something else is to make everybody connected to everything. So I have a chart here to show you the connection that is happening already in the enterprise market. In the corporations we used to have silos, functional silos, geographic silos, product silos. But they began to automate first thing. So automation is only probably in terms of enterprise management is only in the 80s phenomenon in my view. And all integration and they are called ERP systems. They began to automate work and automate integration primarily. So ERP systems came in such as Oracle, SAP, Microsoft now, IBM, etc. Then they began to migrate to integrate external world and networking with them to, and that is basically the supplier. So supply chain management became enormous operating platforms. Then they came to customer facing side which is not the back office but the front office. And we saw the rise of what is known as CRMs, customer relationship management and obviously Oracle by buying out several companies have become a dominant player in CRM. And all of that eventually moves into a truly networked uh, enterprise which is called the e-business. 
And the key symbol of that one is cloud computing, for example. So everything is online now, pretty much. Airlines are al almost there, as you know. I mean, today I make reservations online. I get my ticket printed online, essentially. I can have my cell phone where I have my own uh, ticket, pretty much. I can scan it. Everything is online. Collection of the money is online. So what is happening in the airline industry and somewhat into the hospitality industry, I think is going to happen universally everywhere. So this is the future of the connected uh, economy by and large. I will take a slight digression to show you the progression of each one of the communication devices, uh, networks primarily rather than devices. As you know, in the old days, the communication was face to face, highly localized both by time and the place. Community knew each other. That was the extent. Once in a while, as they married into different locations, they would travel and meet, as you saw in the traditional uh, uh, societies, the clan behavior where uh, one uh, uh, clan community goes in marriage to another clan community and they meet for the first time. They may be only five, ten miles apart each other. With the rise of the mail that came in and the railways, we began to shift. We began to reach further out. Then we saw the rise of telephone, which allowed us to go much bigger, much more, almost globally. Television did the same thing. Internet came along, and internet is a very rich medium, R-I-C-H, but also has an enormous reach. It is the platform that has done a better job in networking than anything we know. Now wireless internet is coming along which says I don't have to be at a fixed place to enjoy internet like on my PC or a, uh, basically a desktop at one time, but with laptop and now mobile devices I can go anywhere and have all the capabilities of the internet as a rich medium and a global reach I can go any place. And the last one that is emerging is my favorite, I, we call it telematics. It is M2M anyways, where I can put a switch and a server in the automobile. Only place switch and the server have still never integrated. But I think I can do it in the automobile. I can put it in the back of the trunk, a small device that looks like the old uh, VCRs we used to have, remember? Or CD players. Now they're all in the dashboard. And I can make that under $1,000 per unit. The consumer does not have to pay for that because it's a part of the original equipment. Just like I get my AM, FM radio and a CD player, maybe DVD player now, it's the same thing. Today, a car has more computer chips, memory, processor and sensors than any other place. It's not even in my house, not in my office even, I think. But they are not integrated. They don't communicate with each other. They're discrete elements. With the switch and a server, I can integrate them and make them communicate with each other. So my car becomes a smart car. Not only that, I don't need the base stations that I have for my wireless networks. I don't need a satellite probably. And I can have now, how many? 150 million automobiles in the world. Then you add all of the motorcycles and scooters, and two-wheelers as they are called. You add all of the commercial trucks. So you're talking about maybe 250, 300 million machines who can become primarily your networking device. So I can have pretty much a mobile uh, base stations. And I can have a mesh technology that allows me to architect that. So networking changes dramatically. And what does it take? All it takes is four, five major automobile companies to bless a single architecture. Put it as an OEM, it gets it a part of your uh, uh, new car buying. And as we sell more new cars, which is what about maybe 25, 30 million units a year annually all over the world put together. And as it begins to grow, I can create the next generation of car standards, just as we today, we get so much of display, GPS, etc. built in the cars, I can do the same thing. And that is the future of OnStar technology that GM has created. Very transformative. 
If it just licenses to other automobile makers, it can become a de facto standard, which is fascinating. And therefore, I have my car. I don't need my cell phone in the car. My key itself is hot synced. My key is keyless, essentially. And I can link it with my computer. And not only that, but my car, as it comes to my garage and sitting, gives signals to my refrigerator and tells uh, refrigerator tells the car milk is running low please tell the driver to bring milk on the way home all network today all possible changes the paradigm we now always have some vehicle with us some mechanical device either car a motorcycle a scooter whatever they are even the farming community has tractors everybody has some device for mobility I can network that. Massive transformation about all things digital. So I'm more interested not in the office and the home as most researchers are, but what happens to that automobile or mechanized vehicles in general. I mean, I can make even my bicycle smart if I wanted to, for example, very affordable cost. Given the cost of memory chips is cheaper than a paper and the cost of processing has dropped so much. I mean, the experience curve of uh, uh, the chips and the software is mind-boggling and therefore it is like thousand times cheaper than only 30, 40 years ago, right? So I can, I can, I can make it universal. So what's the future of all things digital? Here are seven things that I have seen or possibility. The first one is this industry will have more accelerated change, pace of change than we have ever imagined possible. It's moving so fast. So for example, in the first decade of the 21st century alone, you saw emergence of companies like YouTube, Google, Facebook, and you saw devices like iPhone, iPad. It's just incredible. You have also seen Nintendo Wii, which is a very important technology to understand, and you have seen primarily video game as the blockbuster sellers than the movies. A release of a video game today generates $500 million of revenue the day won it is in the marketplace. See the change that's taking place? So everything we measure has to be measured now in dog years. In other words, seven to ten times faster than what we learned how to measure things in the industrial age, for example, which itself was a much faster way of producing things through automation than the agriculture day. So the amount of time it took for somebody to make a garment for you, make actually the yard from the yard from cotton, let's say you made the yarn from the yarn, you make a textile, you make the garment was a long process with automation of the textile industry, automation of the steel industry, automation of factories, we produce a lot faster, a lot more, but that speed is nothing compared to the speed of the digital age and therefore accelerated pace of change is one that means what can a company or an industry do to survive is speed. And this is the problem with telephone companies because they grew up in the Napa Valley. This is the problem with manufacturing companies in general. This is the problem with analog technology companies, for example. So how do you speed up everything? And I believe that in this regard, surprisingly, we should not underestimate Japan. Japanese are way ahead in this technology, but just because they're not in the limelight, we don't understand what they do. Japanese are far ahead. They created the VCR standards. They created the HTV TV standards. The Europeans lost it, the Americans lost it. So I have become more a Japan watcher about the speed of change taking place more so than the Silicon Valley here. The second major thing is going to be web-based applications. Just think of anything that I can do on the web. So all more than 100,000 applications have already made on the iPhone and iPad. You have the Wikipedia, that's incredible amount of content online. Uh, Google Earth, the same way. The imaging of everything on, 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 the, on the planet, essentially. GPS is now a given thing every place, and GPS applications. And the emergence of cloud computing now, all web-based technology. So everything that's routine and universal, the more mundane things. I get up in the morning and what should I do? Well, there's an app for that. 
How should I sleep? There is an app for that. I want to find a restaurant. There is an app for that. I'm on my way and I'm running out of gas. Well, I can tell you where the gas station is. Daily routine becomes uh, pretty much, in fact, more web-based applications. And companies and the entrepreneurs will make money in all those mundane applications. Just think about the uh, route location, going from point A to point B, from a origin to destination, and today I can get my map. And they might direct you and say, it's so many kilometers or miles from here to here, make this turn, that turn, it's mind boggling. And it can be both GPS based and non-GPS based. So this is a second major thing. The third major implication for all things digital is video. So companies that don't have video experience or expertise will be at a disadvantage. As you know, most computer companies are not video centric, they are data centric. Most telephone companies are not video centric, they are voice centric. Most publishing companies are not video centric, they are print or a alphanumeric centric by and large. They are basically, you know, letters and writings kind of a thing. So the real power actually is with the television guys in some fashion. <clears throat> we don't think from that viewpoint, but I don't believe it's the incumbents who will make the transformation of this industry to the level that we can imagine. So the biggest frontier is the video frontier. And within that one, I believe 3D animation in making films like Avatar. So it's not just a blockbuster in terms of revenue generation, but technical competency is built into Avatar. And Avatar is just the beginning of a journey. So I think we need to watch events like that, which are transformative. How many would have realized about video games? And especially I'm told Angry Birds is just a runaway success. I have not played myself, but it's very addictive, I'm told. Remember, I come from a generation where Pac-Man was the beginning. And I remember having Pac-Man either on my computer or in fact on cocktail tables, you know, where you are in a uh, party or something like that and it was amazing compared to the manual games like Monopoly we used to play, you know, which is mind-boggling and Pac-Man is not that old. How much we have moved forward. So video games is the another major change agent. I think 3D animation will eventually find what began for the consumer markets into the industrial as well as the military markets. It has an enormous potential for industrial designs. In fact, a lot of virtual uh, design teams can be formed in a 3D animation approach. Already it is used, but I think it will become mainstream activity. As we have seen, in fact, uh, many of the traditional technologies like uh, online design that were not online but basically computer assisted design and computer assisted manufacturing in the 80s we were in awe this is now the next level social media but anchor to video is the future and we have seen uh, youtube and we have seen the facebook also youtube is much more important and interesting to understand because user generated content is going to be a paradigm shifter. So content will not be created by experts. Content won't be created by people who are in the know, but content will be created by ordinary citizens, ordinary customers, everybody. This is true democratization of technology. And the tools are there and they're affordable. And what adults have done eventually children will do. Remember, at one time, children never had cameras of their own till Kodak came out with more disposable, affordable cameras. Children did not have watches even, but today every child grows up with a watch or some time-telling device in their cell phone. So this is a very key thing where I will tell you the fundamental thing to watch is when artificial becomes real. How many of you have seen a movie called Forrest Gump? You know in that movie, Forrest Gump is with President Lyndon Johnson 
and all the way to President Clinton. When you analyze it, it's all basically film content from different movie shots or video shots in general, all merged and put together. Remember, a lot of that is analog technology, film technology actually. But as we go all digital, I can mix and match anything. And by the way, intellectual property rights just stop. There is no way you can protect intellectual property rights in that scenario. I can sit in the desk primarily and I can pull things and footages from different places. It's like a great chef who has the salt, who has the sugar. Salt has a brand name called Norton. Sugar has a brand name called Domino. Both lose their identity. So there is no brand identity, no trademark identity, no color logo, nothing. All are gone. It's my recipe now. And I make money on that recipe without creating original ingredients. And that's a fundamental change that's going to happen with video as a format. And you haven't seen anything yet. If YouTube can create people very visible out of nowhere, on a worldwide basis based upon what is called viral uh, communication, it's mind boggling. And therefore, ordinary people will become extraordinary. You don't have to be a movie star. You don't have to be a great chef. You don't have to be a sports athlete celebrity. In fact, an ordinary person becomes extraordinary out of nowhere with this technology. Would not have happened with the writing because that's literacy. You have to read and write. Computer basically is designed for college graduates. You have to have competency beyond the normal competency. Video is like television. Any illiterate person can create things, not only just enjoy and watch things. So there's a very key difference. I think this is a major change agent. Next area is going to be low cost innovation. The current industry, those five standalone industries, are very expensive ways of making products or innovation. Almost like in the pharmaceutical industry, where it takes like billion dollars to have a blockbuster drug created, very expensive. So how can you create the same technology, maybe to the level of precision and accuracy that we need, but acceptable, but very low cost. I remember my work at Bell Labs where we were struggling with uh, uh, you know, putting a broadband architecture on a what is called the 2B plus D kind of a thing, just taking the copper wire and making it much more capable. And it was fascinating that if you take a fast moving movie like the Top Gun on a VCR, which is a very poor platform, let's say as compared to Betamax, distribute it in fact on that copper wire from point A to point B in a lab environment and you see the image on another television with clarity etc which was acceptable to all of the consumer people. You don't need that position. What you need is affordability essentially and this is going to happen more and more as it has happened in medical devices or mobile devices like cell phones we talked about in industrial testing and measurement in the world all digital uh, in the past remote diagnosis for example and R&D now begins to shift toward Asia because that is where low cost innovation has been the ultimate obsession of uh, local manufacturers and local suppliers. So the message here is that watch out for Asian multinationals. I remember the days when nobody thought Anybody can challenge, uh, let's say, Ericsson or Simmons or Nortel or Lucent in handheld devices besides Motorola. Nokia comes out of nowhere and we thought what a great surprise, but Nokia is now eclipsed by Samsung. And Samsung may not survive either as more of the Chinese manufacturers come in play. They have the scale advantage and they are obsessed with speed and newer capabilities. So watch out for Asian multinationals. 
Next one is the way the future of this industry will lie is not proprietary standards but de facto standards usually through licensing. So if you invent some algorithm whether it is for search algorithm or an application algorithm whatever you do the best strategy is to immediately license the world as fast as you can. So Bluetooth has become standard, Blu-ray has become standard, Facebook is becoming a standard almost essentially. So rather than having their own customers they can license to in other countries where language is different for example. We have lots of people who speak nothing but Mandarin language, lots of people who speak nothing but Spanish, you know. You can just think about what magazines have done in the past, print in local languages, but you can do it with partners. And then you have the Linux which is an open source by and large and the extension of Linux into LAMP, there are four platforms all open source coming together and it's mind boggling change they're making in uh, the world of special effects or the world of computing in general or all things digital. And internet has been the biggest transform, the great equalizer in the world has been, a world is flat but I think internet has clearly created the flatness where the differences between literate and not so literate people, differences between for example advanced economies and emerging economies is just becoming a level playing field. GSM has done the same thing. I mean I know for a fact that in countries like India, illiterate fishermen will have a cell phone. They have a catch of six to dozen fishes after hot sun sitting out in a small boat, primitive, but has the most modern technology. As they come to the shore, they are shopping around which bazaar locally will pay them more. And they steer their boat from this bazaar to another bazaar maybe two, three, four kilometers. Unthinkable that the most illiterate people struggling for livelihood can have the most modern technology and that's a transformation. So GSM has done that quite a lot as CDMA is trying to do the same time. So what is the best way to stop piracy? Because that's a big issue when you create your own R&D and somehow get intellectual property rights you would like to make money. My view is that the best way to reduce piracy is, antidote to piracy is licensing. Through licensing you can control the other party more than you can do without licensing. Contract laws are more powerful than intellectual property rights. Next one is emergence of disruptive technologies. I mean we have heard about disruptive technologies as a major paradigm in economics and in business transformation. Most companies, good companies that die or they don't survive, why good companies fail, I have a whole book written on this one and one of the key problems with good companies is that they are either unwilling or unable to change when the technology has changed dramatically and in a non-linear fashion. Analog to digital is doing that and uh, basically from non-convergent to convergent industries is another paradigm. So I have seen the following disruptive technologies just recently. Skype I think is very disruptive than people have realized. Cloud computing is on the way and as I mentioned about telematics in the automobile or M to M machine to machine communication I think is a major change and they will become very disruptive. So what does this mean? If the industry is going to be constantly having nothing but disruptive technologies as opposed to technologies which are linear progressive, then it says one should plan the industry and the products from the viewpoint of a short life cycle of products, markets as well as even companies. Who says companies have to live forever? It is very possible therefore that you can create a company and exit it very soon as opposed to having the legacy of the company created. Very different way of looking at the world. Next area is what I call trickle up innovation. As I mentioned earlier in the analog world you usually got your R&D recovered by having the military pay for the technology as we see even today in defense, space etc. 
then you took the product or the technology to the industrial sector then to the commercial sector ultimately the consumer sector but in the digital world you must start with the consumer sector and trickle up to the most sophisticated application consumers are very forgiving they don't need the level of precision it is that bell labs experiment that we did on a 2 plus d you know architecture which is taking the same copper wire making it a little more broadband this is even before t1 for example as a standard that came in which is incredible and very fast moving action oriented movie showing and people thought it was reasonable not precise so you start with acceptable things for the mass market and you make it precise just like software does you know 1.0 2.0 3.0 etc and you upgrade constantly and make it better and better that is the strategy so you start with consumer markets first then to the industrial and ultimately to military it also means you must do reverse innovation starting with emerging markets where the infrastructure is poor affordability is an issue there is a market education is an issue there is no market development there are no middlemen under the toughest conditions if you invent a technology or you create an innovation then you can take it anywhere else and this has been proven by Huawei technologies in wireless they started with their own local market with all those emerging economies issues went to other emerging economies like Africa for example and Latin America and now they perfected the technology and now they are coming to all advanced countries same kind of a message around here trickle up as opposed to trickle down theory is very key in the digital age so the digital age needs masses and masses love digital technology I found this to be the evidence when I researched television industry black and white television when it was introduced in America in the late 40s early 50s 47 48 cost one thousand dollars the average annual income of a family was five thousand six hundred dollars the first people to buy the television were all working class people they were not the rich people actually rich people educated people looked down on television because they patronized the theater and the opera and they thought television was just not the right medium for educated people I remember the most die-hard people who didn't have their in television at their home even in the 80s were like Bell Lab scientists or some professors because that meant you would not read articles you would not see the operas and you know the plays etc by the way I thought that was a fluke so I fast forward my research and I found color television when it came out was the same phenomenon color television was first adopted by the masses the working class people and then it became de facto for more educated affluent people I found the same thing with those large screen televisions remember Mitsubishi was the brand name and today if you look at the LCD technology big screen 50 inches 60 inches they are all primarily in the working class families we don't want to make any social comment on this one but that's the market reality we say is that you get your economics right because now you get a volume and a speed with a de facto standard like HDTV or whatever the standards are you can go global where there's a huge mass market and that mass market becomes immediately revenue recovery for you if the technology is blessed by the masses so masses love the technology and the digital age needs the masses as primary one which cannot happen from the government contracts or research laboratories or industrial manufacturing by and large so which is one more point I wanted to make so let's conclude this lecture transitioning from the industrial age to the digital age will be as transformative on society as was the transitioning from the agriculture to the industrial age I think it will be more transformative personally everything will be more diffused distributed and today if you go in a typical family what happens there is no family get together 
We all live like roommates. Kitchen has become a common area. But everybody comes and goes. Nobody eats together anymore. Each one is in their own room. They're all individualized behavior. One is on an iPad. Another one is on a computer. Third one is on a cell phone. So as we get more and more toward the digital age, we will see a lot more individualization will take place. Individual consumption, individual behavior will happen, etc. It's more transformative on the institutions which gathered us together, whether church as an institution, school as an institution, family as an institution, will have less and less power with this technology and the individuals will have a lot more power. So in countries which are believing in the individualism, will find this technology pushing that, accelerating that phenomenon even more. And the countries that are still very much institutionally driven, such as Asian economies, they will struggle with this technology. There will all kinds of questions, what's the sociological impact of the internet age or the internet revolution? So internet revolution has been more significant and will be more significant than the industrial revolution is my conclusion. The future of all things digital lies in creating huge volume with speed, velocity. That's the only way anybody will survive. You need volume and speed both together. It's not either or proposition. It'll be impacted by large consumer markets of emerging markets where you have the volume and most of them basically have no other installed base of technology. It's like cell phones. Cell phones did very well in emerging markets because there were no computers. In America, since we have put so much of computing power, including PCs and laptops, that we could not accept cell phones as well. We already had telephone systems in place working very well. Unlimited calls. So cell phones became like an emergency, a supplemental thing. Only now cell phones have become substitutes for my telephone line. In emerging economies, they didn't have telephone lines. They were meant only for business or wealthy people. So the masses began to accept the cell phone as the only technology for communication. So cell phone is more transformative than personal computer. And you believe cell phone is more transformative, as we have seen. I think the next device is going to be video game players. I'm imagining my remote control for my television becoming more and more multimedia, where I have a little screen on that. And I can do everything without being in front of the television. It's possible even today. I can do voice, video, everything by having a little screen just like my cell phone. In fact, I can have my cell phone integrated into my remote control. And remote control does not have to be as big as we see. I mean, I'm sure if you have Apple TV, you know, for example, you see the remote controls are so slick, so nice, I can put it in my pocket. They're thinner than my keychain, for example, or my keys in general. So this is a very key uh, likely phenomenon. The core competencies of each of the five standalone industries that I talked about, the publishing industry, the telco industry, the imaging industry, uh, the television or um, movie industry, and the computing industry, all of their core competencies now become core liabilities. They're trapped into that. So new startup companies will always have an advantage in, in this industry, as opposed to legacy companies by and large, because Legacy companies have to divest, transform the culture and the technology in the company. The future of all things digital, therefore, will be shaped by accelerated pace, keep up with that, video technology, web-based applications, consumer markets, low-cost innovation, de facto standards set through licensing, or by government policy, but more likely licensing, and disruptive breakthroughs. Those are the key changes I see happening in this industry, shaping the future of all things digital. Thank you very much.